and we got the largest rookie contract in NFL history, which eclipsed uh, your Joe Namath and, and O.J. Simpson, who were the previous standard bearers. So that's how it all began. And um, it was then that I saw athletes have an extraordinary power as role models. And if I could get them to retrace their roots and set up high school scholarship funds, go to the collegiate community and, and, and Edron James um, endow the full scholarship at the University of Miami or Troy Aikman and Eric Karos at UCLA. And then at the Pro City, I challenged them all to find some cause they'd like to tackle um, and set up a foundation. So those were programs like Work Done's Homes for the Holidays, where he sent uh, 131 moms into the first home we'll ever know, single mothers, by making the down payment and outfitting it. Did, did you ever dream that you would become what really was to be, be a, a very impactful and important person, especially in the sports world? Did you even imagine that, or is that just something that grew and grew? If uh, Rip Van Winkle had gone to sleep back in 1975 and awoke today, he would not recognize <laughs> virtually any aspect of what's gone on in, in collegiate and professional sports, except maybe the play of the game on the field, <laughs> okay? Um, because when I started, there was no guaranteed right of sports representation. Teams, so it wasn't something I aspired uh, to do. There wasn't a field of sports law. Um, I was probably going to be a DA or, or be somehow involved in court. Um, the first major, major change that occurred was the expansion of three network channels and a few independents to 300 competing stations. It meant more sports on television, more games, more analysis shows, more highlight shows um, by a, a massive multiple. And that meant right speeds would soar through the roof. So teams that made $2 million as their share of the national television contract in the NFL in 1976 currently make $130 million. <clears throat> and the two franchises wow. that came into the league back then, Tampa uh, Bay and Seattle, were cost $16.5 million. Um, and today wow. the Cleveland Browns sold for over a billion dollars. So the – the whole tableau has changed. Fantasy sports. Um, uh, they estimate 20% of the business computers on during the football season uh, are being used to play fantasy football. That is really incredible. And this, this thing just kept building and growing. And what was going on inside of you when you were taking on this greater and greater responsibility and representing people that now were household words and making so much money. How was Lee Steinberg feeling about that when no one was looking? Pro sports has morphed with entertainment. So I was able to see early that athletes could be household name celebrities in the same way that, that movie stars were, in the same way that political figures were, that there was going to be a massive explosion. And so we started branding athletes, making sure that you could identify them um, by an adjective or two and pick them distinctly out of the crowd. And so it would mean that they would have the potential to do endorsements and role modeling. So when I had Lennox Lewis, the heavyweight champ cut a public service announcement that said real men don't hit women. It could do more to change attitudes towards uh, domestic violence in young rebellious adolescents than a thousand authority figures ever could. And you could see that, that with the growth of the internet and, and social media, that there were going to be many, many, many more platforms uh, to put content together. Back in the 90s, I put together a firm called Athlete Direct, and we put athletes up on the Internet talking about their weekly diary, talking about their foundation, and it had an e-commerce application to it. So 
um, you could buy directly from the athletes. Well, it became a big hit, and this is back when you still had to use AOL. And uh, we probably put a couple hundred thousand dollars into that project, and it ended up with we sold part of our share for $20 million. So you could see that sports theme, motion pictures, television, um, uh, internet presence was, was going to all explode. Tell us about your movie career, Lee, and how that all came about. I know that's one of, <laughs> by far, the most fascinating stories and another story that's just known throughout the world. Tell us about that. So in 1993, Cameron Crowe, screenwriter, director, called me up and said he wanted to put together a film that would have as its lead character a sports agent and asked if he could follow me. So he went to New York for the NFL draft in 93 when we had Drew Bledsoe as the first pick. He flew up to the press conference with Bill Parcells. He came with me to Pro Scouting Day at USC. He came to the league meetings. He came to a number of games, a number of Super Bowl parties, and I told him stories, lots and lots of stories. And <laughs> then when he wrote the script, I had to vet it to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief necessary to keep you focused on a movie and not jarred if it looks lampoonish or the detail isn't right, that that was preserved. Um, and they descended on my office and took <clears> – <throat> pictures off the wall, and magically Jerry Maguire's head appears on my shoulders. Um, and we took Cuba Gooding Jr., uh, who played the wide receiver Tidwell, down to the Phoenix Super Bowl. I made him pretend he was a um, wide receiver for the whole week to put him in character. And uh, wow. I actually had to show Jerry O'Connell, who played Cush in the movie, how to throw a spiral sure. because he had gone to NYU and that he didn't have football there. And uh, uh, so at any rate, it, it was a great experience. I went on after that to do uh, work with Oliver Stone um, on his film Any Given Sunday, which um, uh, and I spent an evening putting Al Pacino into character and, uh, wow. and a really tough job putting Cameron Diaz into character. And uh, and then another one called For the Love of the uh, Game with Kevin Costner. And I, I know that you were somewhat involved, involved with Arliss. I really like that show. Did you have any part in that? So they approached me from Arliss for storylines and story ideas. And I said, I'll give them to you, but I don't want screen credit because um, I gave them the worst fantasies anyone could ever have in our business uh, that really you would never do in real life. So, you know, we had Arliss um, uh, having an affair with the wife of a player, which is a very fast way to uh, get yourself um, uh, disappeared from the earth. We had him represent yeah. every side of everything. Uh, I was wow. in a couple of episodes, and um, so I gave them my – most nefarious, awful ideas. So what, is, what does fame mean to you? Does it, you know, I was out in Los Angeles for 10 years. I really know what that's all about. Is that something that appeals to you or is just something that came along with everything? No, I think sports theme motion pictures, especially if they're aspirationally uh, uh, based, uh, <clears throat> where you've got, you know, crushing defeat and then redemption at the end, if they're modestly budgeted, they make um, money every time. And, uh, you know, you think back to uh, uh, remember the Titans and Coach uh, uh, Carter and, and uh, the blind side and on and on and on. And now a quick word from one of our sponsors. Imagine being able to train your mind with the same precision you train your body. The Awaken Mind Headset offers personalized audio programs that can help enhance your concentration, reduce stress, and optimize recovery times. It's like having a personal mental coach available anytime you need to dial in your focus or unwind after an intense session. I believe that this tool 
can be a valuable addition to your training arsenal, giving you the mental sharpness and relaxation needed for those critical moments when games are won or lost. If you're interested in learning more about how this headset can be integrated into your routine for peak performance, contact me at the number below. I'd like to share more about how this technology can support your journey to the top. Wishing you continued success and looking forward to the possibility of contributing to your legacy as a professional athlete. And what, what does fame mean to you? What does being famous mean to you? Is it just something that comes along with things or is that something that appeals to you? I've always bifurcated my life so that, that on a basic level, um, uh, the, there's none of that. It's about um, family. My dad had two core values. Number one was to treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was to make a meaningful difference in the world and help people who can't help themselves. So to the extent that, that there's profile here, it's a tool to help uh, with, with doing good with the fact that at our Super Bowl parties, we, um, this year in San, uh, New York City, uh, last Saturday, although it seems like weeks ago, I held a party for about 3,000 people at the Super Bowl. Big business, politics, wow. sports, entertainment. Wow. Um, so, you know, at one point, I'm sitting between uh, Winona Judd and Karina Smirnoff at Dancing with the Stars and and uh, Kevin Costner came. But the point was we did a live uplink between the party and troops in the field in Afghanistan. And oh, um, the, so the stars could interact, and we raised money for the Navy SEALs. Uh, when we held the party in Miami, it was the time of the earthquake in Haiti, and people were dying from cholera from impure drinking water. So we took a water machine that could purify water for 140,000 people a day and shipped it straight from Miami to Haiti. So profile um, creates a, a, an opportunity to do good, which is uh, why it's important. I'm under no illusion, excuse me, Bruce, that this is a – some lasting achievement, you know, the newspaper clippings fail, uh, uh, everything fades, uh, and what you're left with is what your relationships were like as a, as a son, as a parent, as a friend, and uh, did you bring some good into the world? I think that's great. It's uh, hopefully the way I uh, live my life with my, uh, my wife and my daughter and the work that I do. I think that's great. You know, in the introduction, uh, I said uh, how much money you made for your clients, and then I said you also donated $600 million to various charities around the world. I think that's incredible, and I, uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm getting more and more impressed by hearing from you and how you run your life. Let me ask you about your book and, and why you wrote it. What was your goal in writing it? Well, the first thing was I had a period in 2007, 8, 9 where I struggled with alcohol. There had been some reverses in my uh, private life where my father died of cancer. My two kids were diagnosed with an incurable eye disease. We lost a home to mold uh, and flooding, uh, knocked it down, and eventually I got divorced. And, and I felt like Gulliver on the beach, tethered down, with little effusions sticking forks in me. So I used the wrong way to blot out um, all the problems, and it was alcohol. So I spiraled down. By 2010, I realized I wasn't living up to either of my father's ideals, and I gave my practice to the younger agents, went into sober living, worked a 12-step program with a unique fellowship, and decided that sobriety would be first, what and being a good parent, whatever else came was was wonderful, but those were my goals. And that was four years ago. So uh, I've now been refunded to 
to go back out and, and represent athletes in, in baseball, basketball, uh, uh, football, tennis, golf, every other sport, and then use it to power a big marketing arm, and then then create a studio, not in the four-wall sense, but virtually that does sports-themed motion pictures, television, reality shows, uh, contests, um, video games, uh, any app that can be used to bring fans uh, closer to, to sport, um, and been very active on the concussion movement. I have a chapter in the book about concussion, because I think it's ticking time bomb in an undiagnosed health epidemic, and wanted to to give people who are interested in sports either an inside look at how it goes on or more of a template for how they can be involved. And what is the name of your book and how can people purchase it, uh, Lee? It is called The Agent, St. Martin's Press, The Agent, and it's um, available at Barnes and Noble and bookstores, and also on Amazon.com and iTunes.com uh, and Barnes and Noble.com. I've I've got someone asking. If you don't mind, let's go back to uh, Jeremy McGuire for a second. Two quick questions. Did you like the movie personally? Me, it was one of my favorite movies. It's one of those movies. Every time I see it on TV, I watch it. No matter what stage it's in, I watch it till the end. And was there anything you didn't like about the movie? I think that the part I liked was it it gave more humanity to what a sports agent does. Um, you know, I spent 23 years with Warren Moon, Troy Aikman, Steve Young, long, long careers, and these it's very personal. My job is to prepare a player for second career, to to stimulate the best values, um, to focus on health. So. Obviously, it's not my life story because you have to start Jerry Maguire breaking in and and the rest of it. Um, so I, I I thought it was a, a good film. My wife said, "Did you have to tell him everything?" And uh, <laughs> it, it was uh, I thought it was good. And as to what I didn't like about it. Was Jerry Maguire at the start, where he's so concerned with money, he doesn't care about concussions, but finally he has an epiphany uh, and does a mission statement. And and we've always had a philosophy, an overarching, overriding philosophy, that uh, we're here to help athletes, to help other people, and then ultimately to try to make an impact on the society in a positive way. Um, the only really unrealistic scene was when Cuba Gooding Jr. playing the receiver gets knocked out in the game and about five minutes later he's dancing in the end zone <laughs> because right um, yeah so, so it didn't mean to minimize concussion that was sort of a poetic license but I now believe that when an offensive lineman hits a defensive lineman um, on every play in football it produces a low level Subconcussive event. So you can have a lineman walk out of football with 10,000 subconcussive hits, none of which have been diagnosed, none of which he's aware of, but the aggregate of all that damage is much worse than being knocked out three times. So with bigger, stronger, faster athletes, we're going to see just an epidemic of the, of the backflow. And it's an existential threat to football because if 50% of the mothers tell their kids you can play any sport except tackle football, it won't kill football. It'll just change the socioeconomics so the same people play it that also do um, uh, that, that box, know, knowing that it's a way out of uh, poverty, uh, but they're risking brain damage. Right. So you wrote that manual then, didn't you? That you you're caring about people. You wrote that manual. Well, the, the, that they portrayed you know, in the movie. Yeah, Jerry Maguire had his own form of it. Our form of it is is just the basic philosophy. And if a player is not interested in laying down roots and serving as a, a role model, then um it's not 
someone I'd want to represent because, right. and I've always profiled players to make sure that we get uh, players that are going to be ambitious. So three of our former players are minority owners of teams for done with Atlanta and, uh, and uh, drawn Cherry with Jacksonville, which I think he's just divested and Ray Childress with Houston. So, this generation has a massive chance to be um, successful. So when the 49ers are in training in Santa Clara, right below them is Silicon Valley and the biggest venture uh, capital uh, aggregation you could find. So the point is to get those athletes to network. And gee, it's not by um, it's not by chance that we have. Uh, Steve Young already having sold a computer company and now with a big hedge fund and Brent Jones with a couple billion dollar hedge funds. So this generation yeah, of athletes can be massively successful economically. What do you think of the 50, 75, 100, 150, 200 million dollar contracts that are being one player is getting? How do you think that's affecting sports? I it, it has the most effect on baseball because yes. um, when the Angels put all that money down on Albert Pujols, who's not really been productive, they're paying a player for what he did in the past. They're not actually projecting in the future. So be, all the contracts in baseball are guaranteed for skill and injury. So the day that that athlete signs the contract, he knows he'll get every single penny of that money, whether he's hurt, whether he's talented, he just gets paid. In football, when you see a contract like that, all that's guaranteed is the bonus or the guaranteed portion, and the yearly salaries are not. Um, and so you could theoretically construct any massive figure you want by putting enough later years at huge figures, but they'll never be played at those figures. So the the you can look at a year or two of salary is pretty certain and whatever the bonus was. And beyond that, they're just numbers because all salary counts, quote, against the cap at its full figure. Bonus gets amortized. So it's not possible if the salary is twenty million dollars to have one player taking up you know one sixth of the salary cap when there are forty uh, 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 six seven players to pay. So, right. um, but but it's not that they take away incentive. Most athletes are so hyper competitive that they would try to beat you at tiddlywinks. Um, they're <laughs> they're the fact they're paid is is wonderful uh, for them, but the point is they love to play. They love the camaraderie in the locker room. They love the the whole esprit de corps. They love the structure. They love the intensity of the competition um, on the field, and this is what they've done. So it's not like a player gets a big guaranteed contract, and then he says, oh, boy, I've hit the riches now. I don't have to, to perform anymore. They have too much pride for that. That's good to hear. That really is good to hear. And you said earlier that you're you're uh, absolutely back in the uh, agenting world, and you're looking to make an impact in the 2015 draft, and you've got some people that you're already uh, taking on or looking at. So we were so late in the funding in November that basically most of the decisions for players coming out of college this year and getting drafted in May were already made. Um, but I had represented a quarterback named Gail Gilbert, uh, who played tw like 12 years, five Super Bowl uh, uh, rings, none of which his teams won. And which of course meant that he, played for Buffalo in the four Super Bowls. 
And <laughs> his son is an outstanding prospect at quarterback, Garrett Gilbert, quarterback SMU, and he's a real sleeper. So we'll be helping him. And uh, the quarterback position is just much more key than anything else in terms of opportunity. You know, one of the, I'm so interested to hear uh, a little bit more about the trouble that you had. Uh, what was it for you? Because most people might not ever recover. What was it? What angel came to you? What happened with you when you said, wow, I am really going up a bad alley here? Because most people don't recover. How did you well, change your life? It, it, what what happened, Bruce, is I hit bottom. And I think that to really recover from a serious addiction or problem with a substance, it's necessary to be so desperate and so lost that that um, that I was willing to take help and follow a certain direction. And I did it in a unique fellowship in a in a twelve step program um, with regular meetings and and uh, uh, work those 12 steps and it's uh, and that's where I was and I was so uh, confused and broken that if someone had said you know you need to hang upside down in a tree for five hours a day I'd have done it so I did everything that anybody suggested as paths to recovery from going to the uh, local and international conventions, the spiritual retreats, to all the rest of it. And um, recovery is really difficult in the first uh, months. But after a while, the cravings leave and the, you know, ever-present thought process about alcohol fades away. And then it becomes uh, a matter of ma maintaining and doing those activities that maintain sobriety, but um, it's not a daily struggle. Right. Did, 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 you, did you, like they say, fall off the wagon a few times before you were able to get it right? Absolutely. Um, that's what 2007, 8, and 9 were about. So it was, I was struggling and trying, um, but, you know, I'd put some sobriety together and then I'd fall back. But this time... And then March 21st, it'll be uh, four continuous years of sobriety. Uh, that's that's terrific. Congratulations. What what would you tell someone now, an average everyday person, or the player who's getting lost in drugs or alcohol, trying to hide it? What would you tell them if they were standing right in front of you right now? The key is to understand that first of all we can prove through testing that athletes have less problems with addiction, less problems with domestic violence, less problems with all of that than they ever have before. Having said that, the coverage of every discouraging development <laughs> is trumpeted you know, newspapers and talk radio and blogs around the country. So you're much more aware of it. Uh, but it's, um, to, to anyone who's young, I say, if you can stop the behavior young and get through it, um, go to the underlying causes because the use of the substance isn't the cause. It's, uh, it's, it's, a uh, uh, mistaken cure um, and so it's it's to try to deal with it forthrightly and break uh, denial of, uh, about that um, which is sort of the key because then you can have a happy life you know just one last thing we talked about it before you're very generous in giving to charities tell us where you are with that right now with all the disruption in your life still the same philosophy for the players we represent and and many of the things I've funded are still going on um, so I got really concerned about the rise of skinheads and uh, 
nascent uh, racists and anti-Semites and went to the Anti-Defamation League and said, we need to create a training program where young professionals, uh, doctors, lawyers, teachers, um, are given a year of training in how to intervene in a crisis situation, how to spot good intelligence for police departments on hate groups, how to go into school systems and um, design programs that promote ethnic uh, uh, tolerance. And so by the time I was done, we we were in 30 cities. It was called Steinberg Leadership. And they were cranking out, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of new volunteers in the fight against hate. So the way I looked at it was I wasn't alive during the Holocaust. I wasn't alive during American slavery. Nothing I can do about that, but I sure can do something about um, making sure that it doesn't happen here in our time. That's great, Lee. I want to thank you so much for being on the show and for allowing me to share you and your story and your life with my listeners and to all the listeners from this point forward who want to learn about you on your website. This, this show will be available on a link for anyone to hear about your book. Tell people one more time about the, your name of your book and where they can purchase it. And, uh, and then I just, again, book, thank you so much for being on the show. The book is called The Agent, My 40-Year Career, Making Deals and Changing the Game. It's the Thomas Dunn imprint of St. Martin's Press. And you can order it off of Amazon.com in better bookstores, barnesandnoble.com, um, iTunes, um, and it, uh, I, I hope it, it is something that's of value to people in their own lives. Well, again, thank you, Lee, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I wish you all the best. I'm going to be watching you uh, uh, as much as I can from here in the South Florida, and all the best, and congratulations on all you've done and all you're doing again right here now. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for listening. What a great show. Now a quick word from one of our sponsors. Imagine being able to train your mind with the same precision you train your body. The Awaken Mind headset offers personalized audio programs that can help enhance your concentration, reduce stress, and optimize recovery times. It's like having a personal mental coach available anytime you need to dial in your focus or unwind after an intense session. I believe that this tool can be a valuable addition to your training arsenal, giving you the mental sharpness and relaxation needed for those critical moments when games are won or lost. If you're interested, and learning more about how this headset can be integrated into your routine for peak performance, contact me at the number below. I'd like to share more about how this technology can support your journey to the top.